if you're in a feedback control loop <coughs> and you're asking to make a change to your process, so here's my set point, for example. Here's my controller GC. Here's that valve now that we're talking about. And then my process, and I'm feeding back. The moment that valve gets stuck, let's say it gets stuck fully open at 100%, and let's say we're trying to make a set point change, I'm coming back around here, and the controller is going to tell the valve to open even more. If the valve is already at 100%, it's still not reached set point, so it's going to come around here, the feedback controller is going to say, look, this error here is still large, and the controller is just going to say, open the valve some more, but you're already at 100%, and so you just keep cycling around. You actually can never break, break that loop. So there's, there's, a, there's a key problem right there the moment your valve saturates. And in fact, the moment your valve saturates, this control system might as well not even be here. You're basically taking the control system away. The moment that you're at 0% or 100%, that controller might as well not be there because any action that this controller is asking the valve to do is not happening. So you might as well have just simply broken that loop and you're running, running open loop. So we don't like to saturate. Saturate leads you to be in a point where you're stuck and you're unable to do anything. So you can take a look at what saturation does. Let's take a look here as a concrete example. Uh, I'm going to leave the set point here at zero in the simulation. And I'm going to make a step change to a disturbance. Let's observe what that disturbance does to my output. So we just run the process. There's a regular feedback controller, a, a regular proportional integral controller. There's a disturbance coming in, and what we see happen is my control variable deviates upwards and then comes back to zero eventually. So that's a regular proportional integral controller, and it's able to do its job. If we take a look at the manipulated variable, the manipulated variable is initially at steady state. And to counteract the disturbance, the manipulated variable needs to drop and steady out at about negative 0.33, somewhere around minus 0.33. Okay, so that's the case where your valve is able to do what it needs to do. Now we can, we can see what happens when saturation occurs. Let's take a look at There's a block that you can add in and see if it's called saturation. And it literally looks like what saturation happens. So you've got a lower bound and an upper bound. So that will diagram indicate what saturation does. You can specify in that block what your lower limit and your upper limit is. So I've specified lower and upper bounds for that valve and deviation for And if I put that saturation in over there, I'm going to show you what happens what the control system is asking you to do, that's this line over here, you read that what the controller is asking the valve to do, but then after this block is what the valve actually does. So that's called MV7. So let's take a look and re-simulate that process now. Let's take a look first at the manipulator. So that's what saturation does. That valve is saturated, it can't go any lower than this point. So the controller, the purple line, is asking the valve to close, but eventually the valve gets fully closed and it can't go any more than that, and it stays 100% shut. The control loop, however, is still active, and it's just going to simply ask the valve to close some more, close some more, close some more. And so this deviation variable keeps going smaller and smaller. This is not unstable, right? This is simply the controller asking this valve to shut more and more and more. So that purple line goes, goes like that. The yellow line is it starts like that and it gets fully shut and simply stays shut. So this system is not unstable. That purple line dropping like that doesn't actually create instability. It's simply in the computer system. Let's take a look at what the manipulated, uh, sorry, the controlled variable does. Controlled variable 
that disturbance comes into the process, the control variable starts to rise. You can see the valve starting to close. And then when it gets to a point where it's fully closed, it can't do anymore. So what essentially happens is that disturbance that comes into the process has its full effect. This disturbance coming in keeps coming in, and as long as that disturbance is active, this control variable will stay away from zero. So it will stay away from the set point. Essentially, we've broken the loop, we're operating open loop, and any disturbance that comes into the process now hits us. We can't do anything about this disturbance because that valve is fully shut. So what do we do? Well, one thing that we have to do in practice is we have to break that disturbance from impacting our process. Okay, that's the only thing that we can practically do is stop the disturbance from coming into the process or counteract the disturbance with some other manipulated variable. Okay. So from a practical point of view, it simply says we've got no degrees of freedom. Your valve is fully shut, you might as well not have that valve. You now need to take some other action, add in some other way to change the process. That's the only practical way to break that problem. There's another problem that happens here. The other problem is, and this is where 4 e kicks in, 4E, Dr. Schwartz will talk, teach you all about this, is that this purple signal, which is the error, uh, sorry, the output from the, the control variable, that error in the control loop is accumulating. Remember the integral mode in the control loop simply takes the accumulation of the error. So your integral is just going to grow and grow and grow and grow. So what we need to do at some point is simply reset that error back to zero and start from scratch. So that's called uh, a reset wind up controller. So those are, those are more sophisticated control loops. Dr. Schwarz will teach you all about that in 4 And I just want to point out this topic of saturation to you so you're familiar with it. And the reason why I want to point it out as well is because saturation is one of the key limitations in control loops. So we're going to talk about limitations a little bit here. <coughs> Let's maybe just put the first one down here. We'll talk about in a minute is saturation. I'll come back and say and add a few more points to that in a minute. We don't like saturation, it essentially takes your control away from you and you're stuck back in the loop. Let me talk about the next point here, inferential control. So the reason why I'm putting these two terms out here today is because you'll hear them in your career in the future. And this course is the most suitable place to talk about them. So inferential control is, let's say you're the following. Um, it may not apply to all modern cars these days, especially hybrid vehicles, which would not work well. But if you think of really an old car from the 1980s, standard car in particular, let's say you're driving the car and your speedometer breaks. So your gauge that's telling you how fast you're going breaks. So you've lost that sensor. What other way might you use to tell how fast you're going? The RPM. Depending on the gear you're in, the RPM is going to be related to the speed. Anything else related to that? But you want a number, or you want an approximation. So yeah, you can keep up with traffic, but that's not telling you how fast you're going. What might be some other way you can get a rough idea? Order of, like, say, 20 kilometers per hour plus or minus this. Well, you would find yourself like, and count how, how many kilometers you're going, and then just type just speed based on that. OK, so you're using your odometer then to calculate your speedometer with a stopwatch. OK, I didn't think of that one, yeah. Any other way that you can tell in real time how fast you're going, roughly, related to the RPMs? Maybe the sound of the vehicle, right? The engine sound. So you've got a very clear understanding of the relationship to the sound to the speed of the vehicle, especially if you've driven the car many times you may have an appreciation for that. That's what inferential control is. 
Inferential control is using some other variable to control your process instead of the actual variable that you're controlling. Okay? We do we use inferential control in cases where our sensor, our true sensor, is expensive. Okay, so some sensors, especially those that measure composition, they're very expensive. They can cost in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if we don't want to purchase that, ex that expensive sensor, or we don't believe the benefit from the sensor will be worth the money, if we still would like to control that variable, we might consider an inferential sensor. Okay. Your true sensor might be slow, very slow. Okay, so some sensors, especially those that measure composition, they take a sample and they'll return a value back for you maybe two hours later. What if you learned about time delay in this course? Yeah. It's not good, right? You showed yourself in the assignment that long time delays lead you to instability. You can't control that process very well. Your integral absolute error is really high if you've got long time delay. So a slow sensor is going to cause time delay, which will cause you not to be able to react to changes in the process. Okay, so expensive sensors, slow sensors are reasons for inferential control. Now, when we choose an inferential sensor, we obviously want a good relationship between the variable that's cheap and fast that we're going to use Okay, so this presupposes that we have some alternative and that alternative must be cheap, it must be fast, it's got the opposite characteristics of the true sensor, but we also need a good relationship to the true sensor. So the sound of your vehicle, if you're using the sound of your vehicle to judge your speed, there's a rough relationship there. It's not a very good one, but it, it can work in a pinch. Let's take some chemical engineering examples of inferential sensors that you will come across, particularly those of you that work in the petroleum industry. We see this on distillation columns all the time. So if we take our feed to the distillation column, Let's just take a look at the top part of the column here. We've got our trays in the distillation column, and then we've got our condenser coming over here, level control. And that condenser, we take a stream, and we send some reflux back to the column, and we take our distillate D off over there. And one of the key variables we want to control is XD, the composition of that distillate. Now, we could spend a lot of money and purchase an analyzer and use that analyzer over there to measure XD exactly. And using that analyzer then, we would manipulate our reflux <coughs> flow back into the column. So that's a typical control loop. Is increase or decrease your reflux flow back into the column to adjust your purity XD. And we know, we understand the cause and effect relationship from that manipulated variable to that control variable very well throughout thermodynamics and chemistry. But that analyzer might cost $50,000, $100,000, and in addition to the high cost, it's a slow, slow sensor. So what you will see in practice is instead of measuring the composition A with that long time delay and a high cost, we can replace A with a very cheap, fast measurement of the temperature. I can find the tray temperature over here, um, put that T over there. So this temperature might be tray number four, tray number five. And we can use that temperature to manipulate that valve. And the reason why that works so successfully is because 
we can do a few experiments. We can do a few experiments and quickly determine the relationship between temperature and this composition XD here. And we might find that with a few experiments we see a fairly negative relationship between XD and T. So by controlling T, controlling the temperature, we're essentially controlling XD as well. So we don't actually have to measure XD. As long as we control and keep temperature constant, we've got a good way to control the composition too. <coughs> so you'll, you'll definitely come across this sort of inferential sensor on a distillation column. Another example where I've used this uh, before I've worked with Petro Canada, and we, one of the key variables we wanted to measure was the vapor pressure. The Antoine uh, equation tells us what the vapor pressure is. So recall the Antoine equation from Thermo? Yeah? Thermodynamics, there's a log P and a log T in there, right? So vapor pressure, if you were trying to measure vapor pressure here on the top of your column, I an analyzer that measures the vapor pressure, that's expensive. And that's an eight hour lab, lab test. But if we can measure temperature, and we can measure pressure, those are two very cheap sensors. I can measure temperature and pressure. I can then calculate the vapor pressure as a function of that temperature and pressure. Now the Antoine equation has logs of temperature, it has logs of pressures, it has some constants in it that depend on the vapor liquid equilibrium for the system we're dealing with. But temperature is cheap and fast. Pressure is cheap and fast. And combined together through this function, there's a good relationship to the true vapor pressure. So what Petro Canada does, as well as every other petroleum company in the world, is that they measure the temperature and pressure, put it through a very nonlinear function, predict the vapor pressure, and that prediction of vapor pressure becomes their controlled variable. They don't actually measure the vapor pressure. They periodically will. Every eight hours, an operator goes, takes a sample, puts it in the lab machine, and makes sure that the prediction is still good. Okay. And if it's not good, they go tweak this, this nonlinear function to make, it, make the predictions match. But in real time, then, every minute, they can use this prediction of vapor pressure rather than waiting eight hours to use the true vapor pressure from the lab. Okay. So there's an inferential <coughs> sensor with two variables, T and P. Here was an example of an inferential sensor with one variable, just the temperature. Another example, let's take a third one to wrap this up. If you're controlling a reactor, a reactor that might be endothermic or exothermic, doesn't matter which, if you adjust and control the temperature in the tank, what you're also adjusting and controlling is the conversion. If we're familiar with reactor design, the temperature and conversion are strongly related to each other. And so if you control the temperature in that vessel, you're essentially controlling the conversion without having to purchase an expensive analyzer to measure the composition. So there again is an example of an inferential system where conversion X is being inferred by, by the temperature T. Okay, everyone clear on those three examples in the concept of inferential sets? Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about limitations here. So process control, as we've, dis as we've discussed in this course, works really well if everything goes smooth. Right? So you've got a valve that can open and close. Remember, that's the first criteria. If we look at what, it, what makes up the control system, is we need a sensor, we need a valve, we need a set point, and we 
need a controller. If we have those four elements in place, this was way back in week one, back in January, we saw as long as we have those four elements, we have a control system. Okay, so we have a feed forward control system, a feedback control system. These are the four essential elements for a control system. And we've generally assumed that we have those four available to us and working well. What I'm going to just quickly consider here are things that limit control performance. So when I talk about control performance, typically we want small error and we want no offsets. So let's think back to an earlier class as well we looked at the objectives of the controller. Small error was one, offset three was the second, and the third criteria is we wanted generally smooth manipulated variable behavior. that in fact the CN common tuning rules try to optimize. Firstly, small error was the primary objective that its offset free is easily achieved by adding the integral mode. And thirdly, that you don't take too aggressive changes in your manipulative error. So let's talk about where things go wrong. Well, the first one that might go wrong is this topic we just looked at earlier of saturation. Saturation is when your valve essentially is out of commission. If you've got a 0% valve or a 100% valve, you might as well have no valve. If your valve is fully shut and fully open, that valve isn't able to do anything for you. So you've essentially taken one of the elements of the control system away from yourself, and you don't have a controller anymore. So that's a very severe limitation when we have saturation. And the reason why I'm talking about limitations is I want you to start thinking if in the form of when you're designing a chemical plant or you're making changes as an engineer, your role in the future will be to make improvements to an existing process. You're going to have to maybe add a new pipe, a new heat exchanger, and part of your decision making is to decide what size of valve. So you need to make sure that you've got the capacity on that valve to make the necessary manipulated variable changes. If you buy a valve and a pipe that has too narrow a range of flow rates, your valve is, is going to be regularly fully open or fully shut. Okay? And you don't want that because you lose your ability to control the process. So that's one of the first major limitations. The other limitation that comes is long time delays. So long theta. And typically that time delay comes from where you place your sensor. So where you choose to locate your sensor will lead to long time delays or short time delays. We typically place our sensor as close to the control variable as possible. Right? So wherever we want to measure that control variable where it matters, we want to place your sensor. So long time delays will also cause a problem. The sensor itself might have a long time delay. So as an engineer, you've got two objectives when you buy a sensor, is where do you put it, and how long does it take before you get a value from it. So temperature, pressure, flow, level, those sensors you never have to worry about. Those get very quick answers for you. But things like composition analyzers, they have a long time delay, and we've learned from processes that long time delays or severe limitations. So there's, there's a second limitation. The third limitation is your delta T, your sampling time. Okay, we, we spoke about 
spoke about this in one of our earlier classes. We said long sampling times essentially are just another form of time delay. And we said that in fact delta t over 2 is the induced time delay from the sampling time. So whatever your delta t is, divide that by 2. And that's sort of like adding an extra time delay to your process of that amount. So whatever time delay you already have in your process, you add to that by choosing delta T over T. So you as the engineer, you have the choice to fix what delta T is. You can pick it, but you use one minute time delays, five minutes, sorry, one minute sampling times, five minute sampling times. You get to pick delta T. If you pick delta T too long, you're adding more time delay to your process, which is similar to the previous point we discussed. What's a typical delta T? Anyone works in a petroleum plant? <coughs> Any other suggestions? No? One second. Five seconds might be typical. One second, five seconds. Companies will record the data a lot faster, but they'll take action not too fast, right? You can't, you can't tell the valve to move every one second or every half a second. So we take delta T into account of our, manip our manipulated variable in the criteria. Okay, so we're The final one that I want to consider from a limitation is noise. And so noise is not a topic we really focus on in this course too much. I've hinted at it through some of the questions in the midterm, for example, and I've mentioned it once or twice before here in the class, where if you take your true signal, let's say perhaps your process behaves like that, that might be the true signal, but underneath that you're recording this sort of behavior. Okay. So noise is a limitation because if you've got severe noise, firstly you, you don't want to add derivative control. We've learned that the derivative mode doesn't work successfully if you've got a noisy Y variable or noisy signal. So we want to minimize the amount of noise in our process. And we can work with our electrical engineering colleagues, with the people that provide our sensors to us, that measure out our controlled variable to try and reduce the noise. Okay? And there's very easy techniques to minimize the noise. Essentially, what we do is we take the signal that's in blue and we'll smooth it out. We'll provide a, some sort of smoother into the process that will clean up that signal, but a smoother will do the following. Smoother will actually always induce a time delay for you by some small amount, but essentially the smooth version of this blue signal might be something like this. It will always lag behind the original signal. Okay, so we've got that as a final limitation. Okay, now I want you to forget everything we've covered in this course as it applies to chemical engineering. And I want you to think a little bit critically. Right? We go to university not just to get a degree in engineering, but we go to university so we get some life experiences where we can see things from different perspectives. We've looked at process control for 12 weeks now as it applies to tanks and CSTRs and heat exchanges and distillation ponds. It's all been very fine and interesting. But many of you are not actually going to work as chemical engineers. I know that already. Many of you are going to start your own businesses, you might own a restaurant one day, you might be a manager in a company that has nothing to do with chemicals or chemical engineering. Can you use what you've learned in this course in that area? So let's take an example. You decide ChemEng is not for you, and you go open your own business. Okay. Maybe a coffee shop, whatever. 
What does it mean to have a set point in your business? Okay, a vision for where you'd like your business to go. Right? A trajectory of increased sales, increased profits. What does it mean to have a controller? Marketing plan. So a controller takes your control variable, measures your, uh, subtracts it from your set point, and it makes a change to your process to calculate the error. Yeah. Could the controller also like just be a manager in a could way? Could be a manager. It could be a person. Right? A controller could be a person. It could be a, a plan, or it could be a strategy. What is your valve? to grow your business, the hours that you put in, the work that you put in, that's the manipulated variable, that's what costs you. Manipulated variables, remember, are never for free in chemical engineering. In real life, in a company, manipulated variables are not for free either. Okay? So manipulated variables is always a thing that's going to cost you money. That's the input into your process in order to get to your output so you can achieve your set point. So that's in a business. What I've said replies to relationships. Relationships with your partner, relationships with your friends, relationships with your parents. Okay. Let's talk about limitations. In that context of the business example, what would be an example of a long time delay? time to serve a customer. Let's see if we think of our set point as maybe a certain amount of sales that you would like to achieve or a certain amount of profit. If you've got a long time delay in the process, you've got a time <coughs> delay, remember, is always associated here with the sensor. This would be the equivalent of you only looking at your financial statements once a year or once a month. By looking at where your business is going and where you'd like to be, and you do that very infrequently, you're creating a long time delay. And long time delays, we know, mean that you cannot take predictive action. You cannot use the derivative mode in a PID controller. If you've got long time delays, you'd ideally like to take derivative action, but a long time delay is essentially a key limitation for, for feedback control. So by looking at where you're going regularly, weekly or daily, that's a way to get to your set point faster. Think of it in this example. You're texting your friends and you want to meet up somewhere to go out for drinks. You're texting and you don't get an answer. You're texting and you don't get an answer. You don't get an answer, there's a long time delay. There's a long sample time. You're sending a message, you're sending a message, you're sending a message. Eventually you go unstable, you say forget it, and you go do your own thing. <laughs> right? So long time delays is a lack of information, a lack of feedback, a, lot, a lack of the signal coming back to you. Right? So things work exactly in real life with your relationships, with your families, your spouses, your friends, your partners. In exactly the same way, long time delays, long sampling time. If you don't speak to your spouse and partner for two weeks, Right, there's a problem over there. Right? You don't have to be talking to them every minute, but you don't have to be talking to them two weeks. There's going to create some unstable behavior there if you've got a long time. Ago, okay? So same in business, same in life, same as in chemical processes. Those limitations come back. What if there's noise? What if you're running your business? What does noise mean in your Y variable, in your control variable? Right, so some days will be successful, some days won't be successful. Okay, so if you look at your daily sales, your daily sales are going to go up and down. 
And as long as they go up and down in this upward trend, that's okay. So you don't make changes to your business based on the noisy signal on daily or hourly sales. So you've got to make changes to your business based on longer term data. Okay. So everything you've learned here in this course applies to many, many other aspects of the life. I haven't even got to the interpretation of five tau. What does it mean, five tau? You make a change to your process, five tau, right? There's an idea of how long it's going to take to stabilize. You put out a marketing plan, start advertising, your customers don't walk into the door the next day, right? There's a ramp up and a time to stabilize before that takes effect. You make a change with how you interact with your spouse, your friends, your friends, your... That change doesn't take immediate effect either, right? So there's a sort of time to take effect there. Let's talk about feed forward control. What does feed forward control mean in the business? Or relationship with the food. Right, the interpretation is not good. It's yes, Paul. If you think you're going to have a really busy day, you'll hire more staff. So you're right. going to be working. If you can predict you've got a busy day coming up, or you know that your, your sales are related to some predicted, you can predict your sales, you can predict your disturbance, then you hire more staff, bring them in. You anticipate a busy season around Christmas time, all companies and stores hire more people around that time period in detail for to handle the Christmas rush. Okay? So feed forward control works exactly in that same manner. Okay. Another company comes up with like a product, you sell Okay, you see one of your competitors open a new plant or a new supply or a new coffee shop down the road from you. You need to start anticipating how you can behave and keep your sales constant. So disturbances. Disturbances are another thing. So disturbance to a process, we, we're comfortable that if disturbance moves us and we want to still get back to the set point. That example that Mark gave of another company that opens a, a store somewhere close to you, that's a disturbance to your process. Okay, there's all sorts of disturbances to our relationships as well. Other people, other factors. Okay, so this also applies to, to that area. So even if you learn nothing from this course and get to apply to chemical engineering, I hope you've learned something from this course in order to improve your life in some other non-tangible way. So that's that sidetrack, and that's why I wanted to cover it, because I think you, you realize you, you're not paying all this money to go to university just to learn to get a degree in engineering. Everything you learn here is also applicable in other aspects of your life. Let's talk about the exam quick. Um, so the exam is a, a, a week from now. It's a three-hour exam. It's comprehensive in the sense that it covers everything we've looked at in this class. I've just covered some of the topics that we looked at earlier, the four elements of the control system, the objectives of the controller. We started this course by looking at the reasons why we apply first control for safety, to protect our equipment, to protect our environment, to make profits, to have smooth operations so that we can monitor, so we can control. So those seven aspects that we learned at the start of this course are uh, where, where we set our base for this. Very quickly, we went into a whole lot of modeling. We spent a good three weeks on modeling. We learned about the fast transforms as a way to solve complex ODEs. So recall all of that. It was pretty involved. Okay? A lot of modeling in detail. We learned about linearizing nonlinear systems. We learned about creating deviation variables. And we've used all of that right up until today. And all those concepts of deviation variables and linearization are important to understanding this whole, uh, this whole course. So those were the first weeks. Then very quickly we moved on from that to actually understanding what the PID controller is. In fact, we spent about five classes just looking at P, I, and D separately. What's the purpose of each of those modes in the controller? What is the P doing? What is its limitation? What does I add to it? What's its limitation? What does D add to the system? When is D limited in its effectiveness? Okay. So we spent several weeks on the PID controller. Now a controller on its own is no good. We need our sensor, we need our valve, we need our set point. 
We also need to then figure out all of this is no good without a process. So the process that sits over here, we have our feedback controller coming into our process, <coughs> making a manipulated variable change, and then I have feedback back into the controller. We then spend several weeks on the process side. I'm going to make step inputs into my process. So I make a change here into my process with a manipulated variable, make a change in that valve, and I observe the control variable out here. When I observe that control variable, I learnt um, several things. We can learn how to fit the first order plus time delay model to that. We get a sense of how the process behaves, its dynamics. Okay. So the understanding of process dynamics there is critical. We learn about time delays. That's one of our key limitations over here. Time delays. We learned about gains, and we learned <coughs> about tau, the time constant. So those three factors then wrap up what a process is about. And essentially at that point, this is about eight weeks into the course, you were experts at tuning a control loop for set point changes, for disturbances, and you knew how to interpret those process models. What is the meaning of k, tau, and theta in those process models? So that was about eight, nine weeks into the course. Then we had the midterm, and then we looked at cascade and feed forward control. So we looked for the past two, three weeks, cascade and feed forward were very, very important topics. These are simple enhancements to basic feedback control that improve just the regular PID control <coughs> under two conditions. Cascade is a different condition to feed forward. So make sure that you understand those conditions. We had those checklists for feed forward. We had a checklist for cascade control. So two, three weeks on that. And then we spent another, this last week prior to this Monday, we've been looking at multi-input, multi-output processes. So when you've got more than one manipulated variable and more than one controlled variable, an understanding of interaction in that, in that context. Now, We've only looked at two by two cases, and that's the level of which this course ends, is two by two cases. There's no point in looking at three by three cases. That's, again, something we look at in more advanced control courses. I think Dr. Schwartz touches it now in 4E. I know, well, in fact, I know he does, because <coughs> you, will, you guys will learn about one of the most successful modern controllers, the MPC, the Model Predictive Controller. So that's that the MPC or the model predictive controller, that's a great control system you'll see in many companies. There are your control loops. So of two by two, you're looking at 20 by 20 and 100 by 100. So some of the big controlling plants, they'll be running MPCs that are sometimes in the order of 500 inputs and 500 outputs. So this is a very complex, really interesting model predictive controller. So there's a whole lot more. Basically, what we've covered in the last 12 weeks here is the entry level. Everything else, in fact, will build on this. So if you go take uh, Chris's fourth course, that's a base. <coughs> if you take courses on MPC and advanced control, the PID controller is always there as a base. So essentially, that's a, a recap then of the main concept we brought that. And so I'll see you guys in the exam on Monday. I haven't said it yet, I have no idea what's in it. Uh, but the TAs, as I said, will be available on Thursday for review in day.